let's hope this piano is not going to catch on fire. Uh, if you would please come forward and have a seat, we're going to start into our divine service. So please come reverently and find yourself a seat and we continue with our song service. Thank you. We sang about amazing grace. Now let us sing about amazing love. Hymn number 198. And can it be? Let us sing, us, sing it with conviction and power. Like we mean it. Because we do.
our last hymn, we're going to sing my favorite, and that is number one. <laughs> Welcome to worship. Wasn't that an amazing Bible study we had this morning? That was such a blessing, and we get more. The Lord wants to come and reveal himself to us in worship. You know, if we didn't have sin, we would be in the presence, the literal presence of God during worship. And yet, his Holy Spirit comes to dwell with us during this time. And so, um, let's... Where's the handheld mic? I guess there isn't one. Um, but if you can, let's kneel for prayer and come before the Lord. Dear Father, thank you so much for making it possible to come uh, to you, to come back to you. Thank you for Jesus and what he's done to make it possible to come to you. And uh, so we come corporately as a church, as a school body, and individually because you are a personal God. And yet we understand, as uh, we were even studying this morning in Bible study, that uh, we are but dust and we have this form of godliness that is distasteful to you. And so we just want to confess that to you. We want to confess our pride, our humanness, and we claim Christ's righteousness over us. And uh, Lord, I know that you have a special blessing for us, uh, different than any other day of the week, because this is Sabbath, this is your holy day, and you make us holy because of you and what this day represents. And so please do that for each one of us. Uh, personally, you know where we're at, each one of us individually. And do that for us corporately as well, uh, for the church. And so, Lord, as we um, go through this worship service, this special day during our graduation exercises, uh, come down with your Holy Spirit. And um, just may our words and any meditation that we have in our heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. Our scripture this morning is from Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. When Jesus comes and works in our life, a powerful change is wrought. And that's the theme of the opening song that we're going to be singing. It's on an insert in your bulletin. It's not a super familiar one. I just heard it a few minutes ago for the first time. So we'd like to invite Pastor McIntosh, if you're available, uh, to help us lead this song. If I sing it without knowing it well, it will be an unforgettable experience. <laughs> but with Pastor McIntosh, it will be unforgettable in a good way. <laughs> Thank you. Let's stand together and let's gather together. If you're out on the further confines, come on in. There's plenty of seats in the middle. Come on over Academy. Move in if there's a seat next to you. Let's all come together. I invite you to move in so we can come together and worship. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Did you hear that last night in the testimonies? People were sharing what had happened in their lives, and I thought, what a, great, uh, what a great reminder of this. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Play it through us once so we can hear the melody, and then we'll sing it. Try it together. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which I long have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. of joy or my soul like the sea billows roll came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart and my sins which are many are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart there's a joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart and no dark clouds of doubt pathway of spirit since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into Now for me, since Jesus 
Jesus came into my heart. And the gates of the city beyond I can see since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Because of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, I am happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, was a joy o'er my soul like the sea pillows roll. Very special time of the program now. What are we doing now, Katie? Now we're doing the offering. And <laughs> What's it for? <laughs> That's a good question. What is it for? The offering is for Worthy Student Funds. What is Worthy Student Fund? <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of students that sit in my office, Katie, every single year. Three of them are your fellow graduates that would not be here except for Worthy Student Funds. And that's true, right? Amen. I don't know, and, and I'm sure she's not embarrassed about this, but I don't know how many times every year Sonia and I sit and look at each other wondering, what are we going to do this year? <laughs> it's true, right? God has pulled through every time. Now, Sonia didn't get a chance to tell her story, but she came out of an orphanage in, Ro in Romania, and just an incredible story. Uh, and she prays. Did you have your shampoo this morning, Sonia? Yeah. She prays for her. I've heard that in her testimony. She prays for her shampoo. But there were at least three of them yesterday, and it struck me last night, they would not be here except for Worthy Student Funds. Mm -hmm. Many, many students are in the same category as that. Uh, they talk to me. They wonder, what are we going to do? What are some of, you know some of the things that your fellow students are doing to raise money for college? Do you know what? What have you done here at college? I've worked in You've the cafeteria. Worked in the cafeteria. <laughs> so what happens is they work, maybe they do uh, call portering, and then we do a bit of a match for that. Maybe they have help in their church or their parents or their, or their larger circle of, of people that they know, and somehow it works out. And what happens is we're able to use a little bit of worthy student funds, and we just help them going along, and that's how it seems to work. And sometimes you wait till the last day, right, and think, what am I going to do? I always pray with them in my office. And it's the Worthy Student Fund again and again has helped many students here. So who qualifies for Worthy Student Fund? That's a good question. So it actually goes to a committee. Mm -hmm. uh, people actually uh, give, can give the donations directly to the Worthy Student Fund, which is tax deductible. We have some, if anybody will need that, there are envelopes here. Uh, you can put your name and address on that and you'll get a tax deductible uh, that is a tax deductible donation. If you, or if you put it on your check, uh, you can write, uh, made out to, to uh, Weimar College and put Worthy Student Fund on, on the info line. And then it goes into that committee and then people will, uh, students will ask or apply for Worthy Student Funds and that committee looks at the situation and uh, then awards the funds from that committee based on need. And usually we're overwhelmed by the need. Mm -hmm. So where does Worthy Student Fund come from? I'm guessing that's what we're giving to Right now. So your checkbooks, <laughs> your pockets, your wallets comes for the Worthy Student Fund. It keeps our students going. You know what? We had a, I believe it was a lady 
that gave a very, and, and people can specify this, she gave a very substantial donation to the Worthy Student Funds, but she said she wanted these funds to be uh, matched. Rebecca, some of our students went out and they raised funds and those funds were able to be matched. And we just finished the last of those funds just a few days ago. So that was just another person that said, look, I want to do this if people match it. And she gave a very substantial, and that helped many, many students. And then we just, and, and we've been exhausting the pool and it happens all the time. So this is a very good cause and many of us wouldn't be here if it weren't for that. So um, just remember that as you're giving to God. Yes, so Katie, we'll ask you to have the prayer. The ushers have, will we'll then uh, take up the offering. There's baskets there. There's envelopes if you need them. Come see any of the staff afterwards. If you needed more time, we'll be happy to talk to you. But you are the ones. Okay, so this is a, you can, you can actually just put your name and address on the envelope if you, would, if you have cash, for instance, and want a tax-deductible receipt. Uh, or the checks can be made out to Weimar College, but where the student fund. And you will help many, many students, like three of our graduates here, that would not, I'm, they would not be here except for Worthy Student Fund. I and mean, they just wouldn't be here. Some of them were like, well, I guess I'm going home. And they're here, and they're graduating today because they got help. And I, I know they're not embarrassed by that, but they're giving glory to God because of that. And uh, sometimes it's a little overwhelming when I'm talking to them. And I just don't know what to do. And we pray. In most cases, it works out. We do not, and one thing I might mention, Katie, we do not have one graduate uh, or student that's going through that has, is going to be finishing with student debt. Now, some of them may have a little bit of a bill they're finishing off, but some students have eighty or $100,000 student debt when they finish. We don't have one student, and you know what? I don't think, uh, we don't, be, because we're not accredited, we can't have government loans, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing mm -hmm. because there's many, many donors that have been blessed by investing in evangelistic education for our students and there's many, many students that have been blessed by receiving those funds. Mm -hmm. So the need is huge and uh, you're the people that help us and we greatly appreciate that. So why don't you have a prayer for us, Katie, and then, then we'll take up the offering. Thanks. Right. Dear Father, thank you so much for um, the opportunity to come here to Weimar and for all of us who are graduating today and also those who are in the college, those who are in the academy, and also the parents and the friends and the family members, thank you for providing a place where we can come and also where we don't have to leave with a huge amount of debt so that we can go out and we can serve you. And we don't have to um, worry about all this huge debt. Thank you for the opportunity to give to this good cause. and. Um, May we receive a blessing as we give, and also those who receive um, the funds. And thank you that it is an investment, and that we're investing in lives. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. So the, the ushers can lift, uh, bring up the, collect the offering now.
let's pray together. Let's just uh, bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful today that uh, this anthem has reminded us that things can be well with our soul. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Not because of what we've accomplished, but because of what you've accomplished in your own life and what you can accomplish if we give our lives to you through our lives. So we want to glory today in your mercy. We want to glory in your accomplishment, not only in your own life as the head, but also in your accomplishment in the body of Christ reflected in these graduates. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be present as we open your word and we come in Christ's name. Amen. The title of my message today is, Therefore. And if you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, you find that pivotal point that comes in every epistle. Every letter, all 13 letters of Paul, have this same touch point where he shifts from what I would call theology to doxology. He shifts from something that is heaven to earth-focused, to something that is earth-to-heaven-focused. In other words, I see what God has done for me and what a difference it's made in my life. And because of that, I want to do something for Him. We shift from knowing Him to making Him known. Now, hopefully, in our life, that's already happened. Hopefully that's already been happening, graduates, as you've journeyed uh, down the path here. But just in case, I thought we would remind ourselves of that one word, therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, what do you, what do, you do, theology students? Therefore. You ask what it is there for. <laughs> and what is it there for? Because in Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 11, Paul, with, with, with passion and perhaps the most clearly articulated of all the epistles, Paul lays the foundation for the glories and the mercy and the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as he lays that foundation, leaving almost no stone unturned, as only Paul can do, he then sums it up by saying, I appeal to you. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren. Notice how he starts that. I beseech. Really, it's the word appeal. In other words, he does not command. If he has to command at this point, then God was not as glorious as he was saying in the first 11 chapters. If he has to command and say, now you better do what I say, then he missed the point. But now he's just saying, after laying out the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, look, brothers, in other words, we're on an equal setting. We're all on an equal setting here at the foot of what Christ has done. Brethren, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. In other words, the motivating thing here is not Paul's eloquence. The motivating thing here is not Paul's character, although it had something to do uh, with not himself, but the mercies of God. The motivating thing is the mercy of God. Do you see the point being made here in Romans? And that's why he just, he just says, look, I just appeal to you. I, it, it, it's, like, it's like a, a person giving their best argument. Let me lay down all the reasons that I believe Christ loves you. And now I appeal to you. Therefore, brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God. But Paul has a concern. He has a concern, and you find it there in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You see a little concern in this 12th chapter, which, which I might say, you know, this pivot chapter, it moves from, like I said, theology to doxology. And he says, look, 
I, I think there's a concern that I have. And that concern is that you don't fully understand the glories of the mercy of God and you get tripped up with something. Notice it there, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. I say, through the grace given to me. In other words, he says, look, I'm about ready to make a grace statement. Now, any, many times when we talk about grace, we think it's just some kind of mamby-pamby kind of a marshmallow kind of uh, anything goes type thing. No, grace has a backbone. It's not a jellyfish. That's not a chameleon that changes with the colors of the times. It doesn't turn green when it's on a green stage and red when it's sitting in a red pew. No, grace has an objective, right? So and he says, I appeal to you by what does it say there? By the grace given to me, by the way, it's a gift. In other words, it's not even him appealing. Who is it? God appealing. To everyone who is among you, notice what it says. Do not think of yourself or himself more highly than he ought. But to think soberly as God has dealt to each a measure of faith. In other words, he's saying, look, don't think so highly of yourself. Now, why would I bring that up on a graduation? <laughs> We can't. I mean, it almost seems inappropriate, but I didn't bring it up. Paul brings it up. Therefore, we're going to consider it, right? So he says, look, don't consider yourselves more highly than you ought. Now, you, you can consider yourself, but just not more highly than you are. That's, that's, that's one text that shows the risk here. Now, look at another one. Verse 16. Be of the same mind to one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So Paul here, as he is making this pivot from theology to doxology, he says, there's one thing that's going to mess up the doxology when you begin to sing it with your life. And that is, if you think too much of yourself. <laughs> What a terrible thing to say on a graduation weekend. But really what he's saying is, this is not a benediction. You really didn't do anything yet. It's a commencement, as Susan reminded you last night. It's a beginning. So Paul's saying, right? Uh, don't run me out yet. We paid all that tuition. We're going to come to hear the, the pastor that our kids was with. Oh, look what he's saying. It's not really that important. We're leaving. No, don't do it. It's a very important concept here, isn't it, that he's bringing up. Why is that so important? Well, I was interested. I was reading a book, a course um, from Stanford University um, on willpower. And... Uh, it's interesting that the most popular class at Stanford University for the community is a seminar on willpower. What is it? How to get it? How to improve it? It's a seminar on self-control. And By the way, when you graduate, it does mean that you exercise some level of self-control. Now, it may mean your teachers exercise more than you did, it may mean, le I don't know what it means exactly. But everyone working together exercised self-control and they finished a course of study. Yes or no? So this lecture series is one of the most popular at Stanford University. And in a section called The Danger of Progress, in this particular book I'm reading, it had this, th th these studies that it reviewed. One study, they reminded successful dieters of how much progress they had made towards their ideal weight. I mean, it sounds great. Man, you've done great, honey. Look, 40 pounds, gone. Well, not that my wife would ever have me say that to her. Don't complete that thought in your mind. She might say it to me, right? That's what you're thinking. So they reminded successful dieters of how much progress they had made. Then... They offered the dieters a thank you gift. Now notice the thank you gift that they offered them. They could either have an apple or a chocolate bar. Now what do you think happened when they had commended these dieters for the wonderful progress they had made? Which did they choose? 
How many of you say, apple, probably Macintosh apple? <laughs> How many of you say, chocolate bar? How many of you say, apple? How many of you say, chocolate bar? I hope I haven't put undue temptation in your minds even saying the word chocolate. But they found that 85% of the self-congratulating dieters chose the chocolate bar over the apple. And they replicated this in many, many different studies. Now, they did another study. They had two groups. You always had the group that was offered the chocolate bar and the apple. And then there's a control group that were not reminded in any way of their progress with their diet. And guess what happened to them when they were offered an apple and a chocolate bar? They took the apple. So you see, my friends, it's dangerous. And Paul understood this risk. And the risk was that at a time like this, we might, as graduates, or even as teachers, because we've completed and birth some new Weimar students. We might think more highly of ourselves than we ought. She says, don't think more highly than you ought. Study after study replicated it. Another study found the same effect here, interestingly enough, with academic goals. Hmm. Students made to feel good about the time they had spent studying for an exam were more likely to spend the evening in self-indulgent behavior. Now, how many of you are going to be a little more careful now in your congratulations after the message today? I was going to say congratulations, but keep going. Right? You see, that researcher said this, progress can cause us to abandon the goal we've worked so hard on because it shifts the balance of our two competing selves. What did they mean by that? They said, look, there are, there's this part of ourselves that wants to indulge ourselves. Oh, I deserve it. I deserve that half gallon of haagen dazs <laughs> And there's the other part that says, no, <laughs> you should never have that. And when we congratulate ourselves for something accomplished, if we're not converted, if there hasn't been a transformation in our lives, and even if there has, that other self comes up and says, okay, now that that's covered, take care of me. How about a little cookie for Don? <laughs> Self-control, they said, has an unintended consequence. It temporarily satisfies and therefore silences the higher self. When you make progress towards your long-term goal, your brain with its mental checklist of many goals turns off the mental processes that are driving you to pursue your long-term goal. Then it turns its attention to the goal that has not yet been satisfied. The voice of self-indulgence. And psychologists have a fancy name for this, like they have a fancy name for everything. They call it goal liberation. And I hope that we don't have liberation theology here today, graduates. I have accomplished my goal. So now that I have the stool and I've accomplished my goal, I'm ready to roll. <laughs> For those of you who weren't here last night, that made no sense. But they stole the show last night with some stoles. The bottom line here for the researchers in this section, the problem with progress, they said, is this. It's how it makes us feel. And even then, it's only a problem if we listen to the feeling instead of, note this point, instead of sticking to our goals. Progress can be motivating and even inspire future self-control, but only if you view your actions as evidence that you're committed to a larger goal. I hope your goal was not so sorry as to just be the end of the road by graduating from Weimar College. I mean, I say that working here, but if that's all you got, uh, that's pitiful. I mean, I, the faculty are looking at me kind of, you know, questioningly, but would you agree, faculty? Pitiful, if that's the only goal. 
There's got to be something more. When Paul says what it is in Romans chapter 12, what is the goal that Paul points out in Romans chapter 12? Look with me there. Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. Here is the overarching goal. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the goal of the great controversy, that the character of Christ could be reflected and that the great controversy could be decided on the basis of Christ's lovely mercies and his character. Thus, education is only a means to an end, not an end in itself. So what is Paul's strategy? We've seen the problem, the potential problem, and we've seen the solution. But what's the process? What in the world should we do to not succumb to the risk factors that have been identified and delineated in Romans chapter 12? That's our scripture reading for today. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that's the motive, that you do what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service, or as it says in the ASV, which is translating the Greek word letuo, or letrio, which means liturgy, we get the word liturgy from that, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, what he's saying is, the strategy number one is to present your body as spiritual worship. Everything you do with your body, act of worship. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you see the strategy? In other words, worship God fully with body, worship God fully with mind. That's his strategy. Let's look at it a little more closely. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now this presentation of the body of a, as a living sacrifice is big, but I'll give you three words that I'll cover in my strategy since I haven't been looking at my notes. Three words. He reminds them, first of all, we've already done this one, the strategy is to remind them of what's most important, which is the what? The mercies of God. Number two, he recommends a means for accomplishing the most important, which we're looking at right now, which is surrender of body and mind. And number three, because he wants to reveal an overarching and powerful purpose. So, remind them, first of all, of what's most important. Most important thing in the passage is the, is the what? The mercies of God. Now, when you think about that, now, this is so important for us to understand, even today in graduation, the most important thing for us to remember is the mercy of God that brought us to today. Where this was most clearly seen was in some of your testimonies last night and in the offering appeal this morning. <laughs> You simply would not be here without the actions of somebody else on your behalf. You would not be here without your parents. I mean, if you don't understand that, you don't deserve to leave Weimar. How many of you understand that? <laughs> you would not be here without the mercy of God revealing himself in a multitude of ways. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So the mercy of God every single day is something we should glory in. And so strategy number one for Paul is saying, always remind yourself of the mercies of God. Every day. Every day. 
So I began thinking, you know, what are the mercies of God throughout the Bible? How are the mercies displayed? I think most aptly when we look at Christ and his life, we see the mercy of God revealed. But we see it throughout the Old Testament too. And we see it in the New Testament. That word mercy in the original means compassion and sympathy. When we were here at Weimar, we've looked at many different things. Some of you are graduating from massage therapy. Some of you are graduating from theology. Whatever you're graduating from, we're involved in the healing ministry of Christ. Maybe it's the healing of the body. Maybe it's the healing of the mind. But they're always related together. And one of the key texts that we've covered here again and again, I hope, is Matthew 9, 4.23 and 9.35. And Jesus went throughout Judea, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching in their synagogues and healing all manner of sickness and diseases among the people. But what does it say next? Look at this text with me. Matthew 9, 36. It ties it directly with the concept of the mercy of God. Matthew 9, 36. When he had seen the multitude, when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then he gave them power over the unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and disease. Do you see the point? He wanted to remind, Paul did, those who were listening to him, of the mercies of God, not only in the Old Testament, but the mercies of God as revealed in the healing ministry of Christ. Now let me tell you, my biggest discovery, and I think every teacher, if they're worth being a teacher, has made discoveries this last semester that they never knew before. Any of you teachers, have you made discoveries you never knew before? How many of you have made discoveries? All right. And that's the exciting thing. By the way, students, I hope all you learned here was that you need to keep learning. Because because (laughs) you've not even learned half of half of half of what you need to learn. When I was a kid growing up, they had this TV program called Hogan's Heroes. I'm surprised I'm mentioning this right now, but there was one personage in that that particular program whose name was was Schultz. And he was always say to the commandant, I know nothing, Colonel Klink. I know nothing. You need to remember that. You know nothing. (laughs) And neither do I. And neither do the teachers. We know nothing as we ought. Amen? So here's one of the things that I learned this last year. That I'm going to put this along. This might be too complicated, but I hope it isn't. Christ revealed the mercy of God incarnate. It was there throughout the Old Testament. But my most exciting discovery this last semester <laughs> in teaching in the health program was to see the underbelly of the prophecies concerning Christ. And one of the prophecies concerning Christ is in Daniel chapter 9, where it says that in seven weeks and 62 weeks, Messiah the Prince would come. And we always say, well, that was Jesus, because he was baptized and a dove came down. But when you read a little more closely, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, it gives the real reason people knew he was the Messiah. How did they know he was the Messiah? It says in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, not because John the Baptist pointed him out, although mm, he did, but the real reason they knew, I mean, John could have pointed anybody out if this wouldn't have happened. What's it say in Acts chapter 10, verse 38? It says he was anointed with the Holy Spirit 
and with power. Well, how do you know he had the Holy Spirit? How do you know that he had power? Let's just say next. Because he went about. He did what? He went about. Don't miss that point. He went about. He didn't stay. He went about doing what? Doing good. And then what's it say next? And healing. In other words, the mercies of God, just like in chapter 9, verse 36, were revealed in the what? The healing ministry of Christ. And because of that, people saw and sensed His miracles and His mercy, and they glorified God. Now, how many think God wants that to happen in your life, too? That's the point. And I begin to understand that these prophecies we often preach in a way that is not really getting to the practical application. The practical application of a people who follow the Messiah is to act like the Messiah. Not because of their own ability, but because of God's ability. Not because of who they are or what they've accomplished, but because they're pictures of what He's accomplished. Amen? Well, that's 27 A.D. Fast forward, what's the next pivot point in that prophecy in Daniel 9? It's 31 A.D. What happened in 31 A.D.? Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross. Well, how do you know that was significant? Isaiah 53 is an entire chapter saying why it's significant. You know what it says at the end of Isaiah 53? Because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. How is that applied practically? By his stripes we are healed. Not only did he heal physically, 27 AD to 31 AD, he healed emotionally. And when we enter into people's lives, to the extent we do that, that's when we're fulfilling the will of God in our lives. Are you with me? In other words, I don't sense that you're hearing this. Many times we've gone to seminars. I've even preached these seminars where I show all the math. Look, it was four, 490 years. Look, and uh, 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 right on time he comes in. Right on time he comes in. Right on time. Okay, that's great. But who cares what time it is if nothing happened? Are you with me? So we preach this intellectual version of the prophecies. Look, time! Wow! <laughs> A few people get excited. But what if during that same presentation the healing power of God came in and people were healed physically? And people were healed emotionally. How many of you are with me? And it's because God's people poured out their life unto death as living sacrifices. I'm standing on this green carpet and I can't help myself, Chad, but I think of a putting surface. Do you ever think of that? I'm not, I don't even know if you golf. I don't really golf anymore. And when I did, I always got my money's worth was more like a marathon than a... <laughs> but there's a saying in golf, back when I used to do it, I, I may get this wrong. Drive for show, add putt for dough. You know, often our approach to life is to try and make a big show. When really the difference in life is the small little things we do. Christ died in 31 AD, but it only made a difference because from 27 to 31, he went about puttering around, doing good, doing good, doing good, story after story. Tut, tut, tut. And when he died, it made a difference. Because he didn't just do things for show. Everybody had a personal connection with him. Are you with me? 
And the summary was that he poured out his life unto death. Isaiah 53, verse 12. And he was numbered with the transgressors. That's why it made a difference in 31 AD. How many of you are following me? Not only that, he died in the middle of the week. How many of you remember that? The prophecy says he would die in the middle of the what? The middle of the week. But then it says he was confirmed a covenant with many for a whole week. It says there in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 and 26 and 27. Well, how could he confirm the covenant with many for a week if he died? Since he's dead. By the way, I think he died all during his life. Paul would later say, I'm poured out as a drink offering. Mm. He died in life, but then he died. He literally died. But how could he say he would confirm the coming with many if he died? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, if you're taking notes or want to look it up. How can we neglect so great a salvation, which was first spoken to us by the Lord, and then confirmed to us by those who heard him. How could he confirm a covenant with many for a week? Because he had followers that did the same thing that he did. He went about doing good. They went about doing good. He was a living sacrifice. And because of his great mercy on the cross, they couldn't help themselves. They responded to the appeal, and they poured out their lives unto death. I remember that last date in the prophecy in Daniel 9. There was 27. We've said Jesus went about doing good. 31, he died. What was the last date? Do you remember? And who was that? It was Stephen. What was Stephen? <laughs> he wasn't a martyr at first. He was jumping ahead of me. He was a layperson. And then he became a deacon. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 through 6. What does it say, Acts chapter 1 through 6? It talks about how all the disciples began to do exactly what Jesus did. They get involved in healing people emotionally and spiritually. And they were praying and all these different things. And Stephen has almost the, the lowest job of all. Because what does he do? He finds out that some people are being passed by in the daily distribution. This sounds like something pretty simple. He becomes a health coach. And he goes down and he says, wait a minute, you're not getting your little kibbles and bits? Well, maybe that's not what they were getting. But you're not getting, you're not getting your bread? And it's because maybe ethnic reasons or this and that. He says, well, let me just organize meals on wheels. Because God is no respecter of, of persons. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. There's Greeks and there's Hebrews. But no one should be passed by. I'll take care of it. You apostles go ahead and study. The apostles helped appoint him. So it was part of the ministry of the word. They worked together. But he did it. And then what happened? It says, Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. What does it say? A great number of the priests believed. What? They believed. Why? Because there's no longer Jesus. Who is it that's doing it? It's the disciples that are doing it. It's the lay people that are doing it. And they believed it. And it confirmed the covenant to them. And they said, wait a minute. This is Jesus. Because it wasn't just Him. It's His, his members. They're living sacrifices. They're pouring themselves out. And, Jesus, and, and, look at, and Stephen was able to say, they said, why are you doing this? And he said, are you trying to mess up our temple system? He gives him a Bible study, and then he gets killed. But it started because of humble acts of medical missionary work. How many can see that? He poured out his life unto death. He became a living sacrifice. What happened as a result? What happened as a result? Paul, who wrote... The epistle we're reading today was converted. He was converted right there. That's why he wrote Romans. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, I appeal to you. Because what I saw in Stephen's life, he was just passing out bread. He was just trying to be like Jesus. 
and, and he was killed. And, and now Jesus has been revealed to me. I, I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm new. I used to kill Christians. Now I convert people to Christianity. I've changed. There's a difference in my life. I appeal to you. Please understand, it's not about the stale preaching of the prophecies. It's about actually entering into people's lives. That's the most exciting thing I learned in this quarter. How many can see I'm excited about that? I hope you're excited about that. I know you are because I heard you graduates last night say, we packed it up. And we went to San Francisco. And just with that small two-week excursion, you got a glimpse of what Jesus was doing. Let me tell you something. I hope we learn something from that here at Weimar. Because if you learn so much that all of your testimonies basically talked about only two weeks of our educational process, what was happening all the other time? That's what I'm saying to myself. There's an amazing thing that happens when we just get out and go about doing good. It doesn't matter if you get shipped to Lebanon to do it. It doesn't matter if you go to Syria to do it. It doesn't matter if you're in San Francisco. And it wouldn't matter if you walked across the street here in Weimar and found someone of those 600 people that Francois was talking about today and entered into their life. You don't get more holy because you're 2,000 miles away. Amen. What would Jesus do? How many of you think this is something that we should consider? Yeah. And that's what Paul is saying. Now that I have totally blown my notes, let me just uh, make one other point here, and then what time is it? We better start to wind this down. You see, one of the other reasons I want to bring this forward to you is there have been all kinds of people who succumb to what's called in psychological literature moral license. Is that, is that, is that what it's called? Just a minute. I'm not familiar with these psychological terms. Yeah. Moral licensing. What does that mean? Researchers at Princeton found that a person believed, if a person believed and said something that proved their superior morality or righteousness in some area, this left them vulnerable to what psychologists call moral licensing. Well, what did they mean by that? When you do something good, this is from a research report, you feel good about yourself. And this means that you're more likely to trust your impulses, which often means you give yourself permission to do something very bad. And guess what the examples they, 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 they gave were? Ted Hager, who was preaching vehemently against homosexuality, only to be found with a male prostitute. Tiger Woods, who was the epitome of self-control, but was really living a life completely out of control. Elliot Spitzer, who was the governor of New York, known for his prosecution of prostitutes, only to be found with a prostitute. And what they said is, when you begin to picture yourself as somehow morally superior or righteous in some area, you're very vulnerable. Amen. Now, the reason I want to bring this up to you graduates especially is, did you know there's graduates that have left this place who totally have abandoned every single principle here? And they have become actually the opposite of the testimonies that I heard last night. Not only that, I say it to myself and to the faculty, there have been faculty that have been here in this very place that have left and are totally 
against everything this place stands for. How do you explain it? Psychologists think one reason is because of moral licensing. Shoppers who restrain themselves from buying something tempting are more likely to go home and eat something tempting. <laughs> Employees who put in extra time on a project may feel justified putting personal expense on the company credit card. Dieters are more likely to be unfaithful to their wives or husbands. How many want to be afraid when your wife goes on a diet? <laughs> now, how many of you, how many of you think that what I'm saying here has some merit for you to consider? We have to leave here with complete humility today. We have to leave here with complete humility. Our intellectual attainments, anybody's here, mine included, everybody else's, all added together, are infinitesimal. The only thing that saves us is the mercy of God and the wisdom of God. Our intellectual attainments, meaningless, if the Bible is true, without me, you can do nothing. How many understand what I'm saying? So this argument, the apostle, is so powerful. So, basically three points here. He says, look, to mitigate against this whole understanding, this whole vulnerability, the risk that you have, Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Present your members as instruments of righteousness. In other words, get busy. Don't be like David who sent the others out to war. Get busy. Don't even this summer rest. Put into practice what you've learned. Get busy for the master. Give gifts. You have been given gifts to come to this place. Immediately begin to give gifts to others so they can advance their goals. Philippians 4.18 I received the gifts that you sent as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Offer the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of the lips. Hebrews 13.15 Remember the songs that you sang here? What a difference you made in my life. All the hymns, keep singing them. Sing them to other people. Don't stop singing them. Offer the sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 16. Don't neglect to do good and share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Give away what you've given. And do it immediately. So number one was remind yourself of the mercies of God. Number two, present or recommend, uh, the recommendation is to present yourselves as living sacrifices in terms of your bodies, but also your, your minds. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, there's only one other place in the Bible that word renewing is used, and it's in Titus 3.5. Let me show it to you. Renewing of your mind. It's only used two times in the New Testament. Well, I want to show you this, and then we're going to finish. Titus 3, 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Notice what it says, verse 4. When the kindness and love of, of God our Savior toward men appeared. That's the mercy of God, isn't it? When the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we had done, but according to His, what's it say next? But according to His mercy. Anything you do good is according to His mercy. It's not because of you, it's because of Him. But according to His mercy, He saved us. What's it say next? Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing, same word used for the renewing of the mind, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Friends, what I need the most and what you need the most is the daily and moment-by-moment moment renewing of the Holy Spirit. You need that more than any intellectual attainment. In fact, 
if you have intellectual attainments, and if you have education without the Holy Spirit, it's the most dangerous thing you can do. Education that's not Christian education is the most dangerous education. And education that purports to be Christian education that's not really Christian education is even more dangerous. When you leave this place, don't settle for education. Don't settle for education. Don't settle for supposed Christian education. How many of you understand what I'm saying? When you leave this place, only settle for true Christian education. You know what I think true Christian education is? Education that's actively involved in ministry, where the dependence of the student and of the staff is completely on the Holy Spirit for accomplishing any of their goals. Any of their goals. And true education, I might just say this, is always involved in soul winning. Always involved in soul winning. If you're going to go on, some of you, to medical school, don't go to medical school and think, I don't need to be a soul winner. Go to medical school and say, how can I have enough time to win at least however many souls you want during that time period? The best physicians in my church, and they're now members of the board of this institution, were those who, when they were in their medical school, taught a Sabbath school class, did a branch Sabbath school outreach to kids, and had Bible studies during the week. How many of you want to commit to that right now? My friends, that's true education. If you don't commit to it, you're vulnerable. Don't even go to medical school if you're not committing to that. I'm serious. You will lose your soul. You know how many people I have seen lose their soul by going on to a place that doesn't understand what I just said? You will lose your soul. Is it worth it? And you know, you could lose your soul here too if you're not involved in that. And that's what Paul's trying to say. He says, I plead with you. Don't lose your soul for education. Make sure it's Christian education. Does that make sense? That's the recommended means. And why? Let's just finish briefly, although I could expand it. Why? Look at Romans chapter 12 again. Why is it that we need to remember? Why is it that we mean to recommend this living sacrifice um, philosophy that he has? Why? Because the world needs a revelation. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to education. Only accept true Christian education. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may, what does it say? That you may prove. You know what that word prove means? It means to give actual evidence. Literally, evidence or argument for the existence of that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many of you want to be involved not only in education, but being used by God to educate concerning the will of God? How many want that to happen? And that happens in very simple ways. It's not the hard ways. It's the very simple ways. It's very simple. I remember I was in London many years ago passing through and there was a man who was standing in Trafalgar Square. And as he was standing in Trafalgar Square, he was passing out tracts. He was a humble man, but he was a rather direct man, perhaps a tactless man. And as he was handing out those tracts, he would ask the pastors, by and say, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? 
And if they hadn't, he would give them a gospel tract. I came by and he says, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, he said to me. I said, yes, I have. He goes, and what faith are you? And I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, it's of the devil. I said, what? He goes, it's of the devil. And I said, well, I said, thank you very much for that. And I was a little bit upset. I felt my flesh, you know, coming up, but I was, you know, in London, I, I was just passing through, so I just, I said, wow, that's, that's interesting. Probably the rudest guy I ever met. Told me I'm of the devil. <laughs> well, he kept his witnessing up, and a group of skinheads came along. And he said something to them, and they did not respond well to his technique. And soon he was surrounded by a sea of skinheads who were ready to end his life. And here he was in the middle of this square, and they're all yelling at him, and they're pushing him back and forth. And I still remember it, like yesterday. He climbs up on a little pedestal, he puts his arms out, like he's on the cross. And he said, who will stand with me? Who will stand with me for the cause of Christ? Who will stand? He was mocked. He was beaten. He was bruised. Who will stand for me? I'm ready to die. For me, to die is gain, quoted the Apostle Paul. He quoted some of these texts we've seen. My life is poured out as a drink offering. I'm ready to die. Who will die with me? Here I was. And I said, what courage this man has that he would stand for Christ. So what if he rebuked me? That's the only person I've ever seen that has the boldness of a Christian. I've never seen that before in my life. I felt myself drawn. I stood up, started to walk up to go next with him. I'll stand with him, I thought, and I walked up. I would probably be dead today if something hadn't happened right then. The police came. <laughs> <laughs> they took those skinheads away. That's the closest I ever came to dying for Christ, I think. But how many of you want to have that willingness? For me, to die is gain. How many of you want to die before you leave Weimar spiritually or, or, or to yourself, to self? How many want to say, not my will, but thy will be done? How many of you remember Christ who said that on the cross? He didn't want to go through that, but he did it for you and for me. Not my will, but Christ. Not my will, but Christ. If you haven't had that experience here at Weimar, and this is, you're a graduate, and this is your last opportunity to, to respond to appeal, I'm going to ask Erwin to come forward. I really believe you should, re, should respond today because if you haven't made that decision, you're the most vulnerable person leaving this campus. And if you haven't made that decision as a staff member, or as an academy student, you haven't made that decision to the fullest extent. I join the Apostle Paul and I say, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, I appeal to you to look at the mercies of Christ and see how he poured out his life for you and join him pouring out your life for others. Our closing hymn is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. That song was written by a lady who wanted to be a missionary to Africa. She wasn't allowed for some reason, I can't remember the circumstance, 
to do what she wanted to do, to minister in the way she wanted, and she had some resentment. You see, sometimes we can be very spiritual people, but we can have the attitude, I only want to minister in a certain way. How many of you are with me in this? You understand what I'm saying? I'll minister, but it's only in this way. And she couldn't minister in that way. And then she went to a service. She listened to an old lady in her 90s. And she heard the lady praying, pouring out her heart to God. And the lady said, I don't know what you want to do with my life. I'm old. I don't have much to offer. But all I want to say, Lord, is have thine own way. Use me any way you want to use me in my remaining time. And when the author of this song heard that, changed her life. She said, that's what I need. Graduates, that's what you need. That's what I need. I hate to break it to you, but you may never be able to do what you trained to do. But you know what? That doesn't matter. If God, you're surrendered to God, He can use you. He can use you. Let's stand together and sing as we close. Have thine own way. Five sixty seven. sing these last two verses maybe in your heart today you've realized that you've set yourself completely up <laughs> for overmastering temptations by glorying in yourself your accomplishments and you've lost sight of the goal maybe today you want to say I I want to glory in the goal of God for my life. I don't want to look on my, my goals. I want to look on His goals for me. I don't want to look at, at, at this graduation as something I've accomplished, but something He's accomplished. Not my goal, but His goal. If that's the case, as we sing these last two verses, I'm just going to invite you to come down to the front, not because of me, but for you. That you can have a time with God where you say, I'm recommitting. Not my way, 
but your way. Not my will, but your will. We sing those. Invite you to come if God's convicting you that way. heaven we're thankful for the reminder from the lips of the Apostle Paul we've come to this place we've learned many things and we want our lives to be not lives of stale unadopted theology but lives of powerful, passionate, totally engaged doxology. Whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do, we want to do it all to the glory of God. Not because of anything we bring, but because everything that you've brought not because of our merit, but because of your mercy. Mold us and make us after your will. We recommit to you today. We want to totally each day recommit to being reminded of your mercy. We want to pour out our lives for you. We can't do it unless you do it, but that's the goal. Lord, we want to take up our cross and follow you. Not because our cross brings salvation, but because yours has already brought it. We just want to point to your cross. And we just humbly pray that as we have re-surrendered today, that as Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 6, the glories of your mercy would be seen among the Gentiles, among all the nations. And we thank you, and we praise you, and we come in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.